It was January of 2020. Janelle and I had been invited by Dr. Daniel Kim to go to Seoul, Korea to be the conference speakers for his anniversary Sunday and World Missions Conference. The Pulkong Dong Bible Baptist Church was a church that was started in 1960 by missionary Jack Baskin and Dr. Daniel Kim. That church today gives over $400,000 U.S. dollars to world missions every year as a result of the missions influence of the Baptist Bible Fellowship. So Janelle and I had been invited to be a part of that and to speak for their anniversary service and for Janelle to sing and us to be there for the World Missions Conference. And I'll never forget that Sunday morning as we stood there in the church before the services began and Yunsun, Dr. Kim's wife, was standing there talking to Janelle and I and she said, you know, she said, our people just love it when you and Janelle come to our church. I said, really? <laughs> she said, they enjoy you so much. And I started to get proud and pumped up. She said, you know, Janelle sings so beautifully and it's always from her heart. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's true. And then she said, and you, Brother Bender, your messages are so simple. Our people just love it. <laughs> simple messages. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, we come again into your presence and Lord, we admit that we need your help. Father, we are not who we need to be. We are not who you want us to be. But Father, we ask you to continue to work in our lives, to form us and mold us and make us into the men and women that you desire to stand in the gap to preach the gospel, to teach people, and to establish churches until you come. So Father, personally this morning I give you permission to speak to my heart once again, to challenge me, and to change my life today. For I ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. The theme of this conference is the Great Commission Changes Everything. You have heard if through the messages beginning on Monday night through yesterday and even this morning through the testimonies of these church planners. It's been so well presented eloquently of the news of the death, the burial, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel, the good news that we're to spend, take to the entire world. Sometimes in our life, as I thought about Mrs. Kim's words to me, your messages are so simple. Sometimes in life we forget the simple things of life. So this morning, God has given me another simple message as a reminder for you today and for myself. The message is this. The gospel, and only the gospel, has the power to change the eternal destiny of a man's soul. The year was 1963. I was seven years old. My family attended Central Baptist Church in Sherman, Texas. Pastor Lloyd Ledbetter was my pastor, Brother Otis's father. That summer, like every other summer that I could remember, we had a tent revival meeting. And evangelist Tommy Stone was preaching that meeting. It was on one of those hot, scorching, humid summer nights when Brother Stone preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. That as a seven-year-old boy, I realized the power of the gospel. I realized that I was lost. I realized that I was a sinner. I realized that the only thing that it could save me was the blood of Jesus Christ. And that night, I walked forward with my dad at the invitation time, and I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And the gospel changed my life and my destiny. 
like he changed almost all of yours, I hope. If we were to have seen the video already, we would have seen the life of Richard and Janine Connerup, and later, after Janine went to heaven and Connerup, how that God used them in the country of Ethiopia and then in Kenya to reach so many people with the gospel of Jesus Christ and to start churches all across those countries. I've viewed the video. In the time that I viewed the video, I was left, left with a feeling of the overwhelming reality of the great need for people to preach the gospel around the world to the millions and millions of people who've yet to hear. Also, I was reminded of the words in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 35. In Matthew chapter 9 and verse 35, the Bible says, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, when he stopped to look, to focus on the multitudes of people. He was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he to his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers, they're few. Pray you therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into the harvest. Thus, Project 938, praying and asking for laborers in the harvest fields of the world. We understand that God wants and needs people in every venue of Christian life to be those laborers. Your church, Sunrise Baptist Church, as I've watched these laborers, these volunteers throughout the week serving, and I can't help but think, man, there's a great crowd of people, but how many more could they use to continue this ministry? On Sundays, how many could be used to, to be in the nurseries and in the Sunday school classes and in the music departments and all of the things that could be used to further the gospel of Jesus Christ? I believe that every one of us in our ministries could look and say, we need more labors. Today, we focus on the worldwide evangelism through missionaries. And we look at our missionary force through the Baptist Bible Fellowship. And, 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 and Janelle and I were approved as missionaries in 1983 as missionaries to Korea. We served until 1998 until we, we quit. We're quitters. But God moved us. He moved us to a ministry in Arkansas. And there we served for two years. And, and it was during that ministry that God prepared and then we were invited to come to the missions office in 2000 under Dr. Bob Baird. And, and Brother Baird's vision was said, we need 1,000 missionaries by the year 2000. And we were well on the way almost to that number. But then in the past 23 years, our numbers have declined. They've fallen. And yet the world population continues to grow. Do we need more missionaries? Absolutely. I look at the missionary families that we recognized this morning, and I thank God for George and Luisa DeMacos, who for 30 years have served under Ken Lyle's direction in the country of Greece. Actually, the Holy Spirit of God. They served there, but they're not young anymore. I look at Randy and Linda Perkins, and they stand here have dealt with cancer and bone marrow transplants and celebrate 50 years. And they say, we want to continue until God calls us home. I thank God for people with commitment like that. But I say to you, we need more. We need more men and women that would say, God, use my life. Take me. Send me to the far-flung regions of the world that I might serve you to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is the gospel and only the gospel that has the power to change the eternal destiny of a man's soul. That's what it's all about. 
And Jesus said to his disciples that day, he said, listen, guys, look. He said, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the labors are few. I need you to pray, therefore, that the Lord of the harvest would put forth labors into the harvest. He said, just look around. The need is great to proclaim what would become known as the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm reminded of another passage of Scripture in John chapter 4 where Jesus and his disciples had left Judea. They were going into Galilee. And on this day, Jesus chose to go through Samaria. You know the story. It's familiar to you. As they came outside the city of Sychar, Jacob's well was there. The Bible tells us that Jesus was wearied from his journey, so he sat down on the well to rest. And there came a woman of Samaria out to the, water to, draw, uh, to the well to draw water. The disciples had gone into the city to buy food for lunch. And Jesus was there with this woman from Samaria. He's sitting on the well and he says, would you give me to drink? And she replied to him, said, sir, uh, why are you asking me? You're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. You don't even like us. You don't want to be around us. And he said, if you knew who I was, you would ask of me and I'd give you living water. Amen. And she looks at him and she says, yeah, I don't know what you're thinking, but this well is deep. Have you looked down in it? It's deep and you don't have a bucket. You don't have anything to draw this water out with. How are you going to get it? And he said, the water that I give spring up into a well of everlasting life. And she said to him, she said, well, give me this water that I don't have to come here to thirst again. And he told her, he said, go and call your husband. She said, I don't, I don't have a husband. And Jesus said to this woman, said, you're right. You've had five husbands and the man you're living with now is not your husband. And she said, sir, I know that the Messiah is coming, and when he comes, he's going to tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, that's who I am. That's why I'm here. In verse 27 of that text, the Bible says, And upon this came his disciples, and marveled that he talked with the woman, yet no man said, what seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, Come and see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. So the disciples came back with food. Jesus is there at the well with the woman he's been talking to and the disciples came back and nobody questioned why he was even talking with her. And she left. The Bible says she, she left her water pot there at the well. She went back into the city and she said, Hey, hey, come and see a man that told me all things that ever I did. This has got to be the Christ. And there was a crowd of people that were following her back out to the well where Jesus was. And Jesus is there. And the Bible says, and I like this, this word in 31, verse 31, In the meanwhile... While this was going on, the disciples prayed him and they said, Master, eat. But he said to them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Therefore, as the disciples said one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? And Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Then he says, Say not ye there are yet four months, and then come the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, Lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. Now what just happened? The disciples were there. They came back with the food. The woman left her water pot, went to the city. Hey, come and see this guy. You've got to see him. He's the, he's the Messiah. He told me all things that ever I did. This has got to be him. There's a crowd of people following. The disciples are there, and they've got food. And they said, here, Master, eat. And he said, I have meat to eat that you don't know anything about. And they said, wait, wait, wait just a minute. Where did he get this food? We left Judea together. Uh, we were traveling. We didn't have any food. We went to the city to buy food. And now he says he has meat to eat that we don't know anything about. And he said to the disciples, 
Listen, guys, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. And then he says, don't you say, say not ye there have yet four months, and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. You know what he's saying? He says, guys, listen, you're worried about lunch. He said, I have meat to eat you don't know anything about. My meat is to do the will of the Father and him that sent me and to finish his work. And then he said, hey, don't you say that it takes four months and then comes the harvest? Don't you say that it takes four months for the farmer to go and prepare the ground and plant the seed and the sun to come and the seed to germinate and grow to the harvest time? Don't you say that takes four months? And they're thinking, I think that they're thinking, well, of course. Yeah, that's the laws of nature. We understand that, Jesus. And then he said, listen. Behold. Lift up your eyes. Look. There's a white field of harvest that's ready. You know what I think Jesus was saying that day? I think he was saying to these men, guys, listen, pay attention. You're not getting it. I need you to get your mind off of the physical things of life and get them focused on the physical, the spiritual matters. He said, I need you to see what I see. I need you to understand it's not about lunch. It's not about boats. It's not about cars or jewelry or houses, all of these things. It's not about a beautiful church building. It's not about all of this stuff. It's about the harvest and it's ready, and it needs to be harvested, and people need to go, but you're worried about the physical things of life. Get your mind off the physical and focus on the spiritual. Amen. I thought to myself so many times in life, that's where we're at, isn't it? If we're honest with ourselves, don't oftentimes we focus so much on the physical things of life, we forget what really matters, I think about this theme, the gospel. It changes everything. Jesus was saying, I need you to focus. I need you to pay attention. People need to know who I am. They need to know why I came. They need to know what my purpose is, that I will live my life, that I will die on the cross of Calvary, that my blood will be shed for the remission and payment of sin, and that all that people have to do is trust in me because I'm going to go to the grave, but I'm going to come again, and I'm going to sit in heaven with my Father, and I'm the only one that can change people's eternal destiny. And that's what people need to know. That's what you and I need to be preaching and publishing all around this world. I remember back to Matthew chapter 9 when Jesus was with his disciples and the Bible said that when he saw the multitudes, when he focused on the crowd, not just looking over them, but when he paid attention and he looked at them in their eyes and he saw them, the Bible said that he focused and he was moved with compassion. He was moved with compassion because they fainted. They were distressed. They were a sheep having no shepherd. They were wandering aimlessly. And I think to myself, how often do I focus on the multitudes? How often do I pay attention to men and women and boys and girls that come across my path? How often is my heart moved with compassion to tell them that God loves them, that Jesus died for them, that he went to the grave and he arose and the gospel was given for them? May I ask you, when is the last time you stopped and looked at the people in your world with genuine compassion and saw them as sheep without a shepherd, wandering aimlessly through life? When was the last time that we looked at people not with the focus of building our church, 
but ministering to their souls. Amen. This week has been a great week. From the moment that Janelle and I stepped on campus on Friday afternoon, we noticed that things were happening here. We noticed that physically the buildings, the property had been prepared. We noticed that spiritually men and women had been praying for each of the speakers this week and for you that it would come to be here to be a part of this great week in the Baptist Bible Fellowship International. We noticed the volunteers that were spread across the ground serving in every aspect literally from early morning to late at night. Things had been being done. But I'll be the first to admit to you that as we came back on this campus Monday night and we heard the message that Bruce Garner brought to us, and we heard the message last night and the messages yesterday. I have to take a hard, long look at my life. And I have to admit to you that during this week, I have allowed the stuff of this world to lure me away from seeing the multitudes, from having compassion upon them, and from accepting my responsibility to share the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is the gospel and only the gospel that has the power to change the eternal destiny of a man's soul. Amen. I don't recall one conversation I've had with people outside of this auditorium of a spiritual nature asking them about their soul's condition. I've enjoyed the fellowship. I've enjoyed renewing friendships. I've enjoyed the great hospitality. I've enjoyed being with my wife. But I haven't looked at people with compassion and being moved and say, God, use me to reach people. I was reading this morning the New York Times of August the 2nd, 1985. There was an article that stated this. A guest at a party for lifeguards who were celebrating their first drowning free season, swimming season in many decades, drowned on Tuesday. Madeline Richard, the department director said after the party was over, the body of Jerome Moody was discovered in the deep end of the pool. Mr. Moody was not a lifeguard, but there were four lifeguards on duty at the party. Lifeguards celebrating a drowning free season. Lifeguards on duty, but yet someone drowned at their own celebration party. I can't help but wonder how many people have gone into eternity in Fresno and Clovis, California, while we've been here celebrating and rejoicing in the fact that the gospel changes everything. I wonder if we've been obedient, if we've accepted our responsibility to take the gospel because it is the gospel and only the gospel that has the power to change the eternal destiny of a man's soul. I'm so thankful that on that summer night when Lloyd Bledbetter my pastor said, let's have a tent revival. Let's inconvenience ourselves. It's hot. It's humid. 
but the people of Sherman, Texas need the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Tommy Stone, heavy set evangelist, sweat probably two gallons of fluid that night as he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. And God moved on the heart of a little seven-year-old boy and said, my son died for you. He was buried and he rose again. The gospel was given for you. Do you want to accept it? I'm thankful that Pastor Ledbetter gave an open invitation that night for me to respond. I know invitations are not all that popular in many churches today. We don't want to embarrass people. We don't want to put them on the spot. But I'm so thankful that night the invitation was offered and I responded. I'm wondering this morning, has God spoke to your heart? Did you pray with me and say, God, I give you permission to speak to my heart, to challenge me, to change my life. If he spoke to you, maybe it would be appropriate for, to give us an opportunity to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ and God's call.